two. Hello, and welcome back to another fun-filled episode of the Hammercast. I am your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkin. And joining me today is Jared Evans, uh, one of a select few personal trainers in this country, or really anywhere, who has got more than 18 months of experience, which is, as Dan John, who's been on the show a couple of times, has pointed out, uh, that's about the average that most personal trainers last in this industry. So if you can ever find somebody who has more than that, odds are you've got somebody on your hands who is pretty good. Uh, Jared has been working with people for 13 years as a personal trainer in various capacities. And uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, one of his specialties, which is really helping beginners kind of uh, get their stride in training, which I think is, is far and away the most important thing for a personal trainer to be able to do. Because most people, even if they have experience in being trained personally or going to the gym or stuff like that, they really are beginners. Like they have uh, a hard time with some basic skills on average is not true for everybody. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about how he helps people go from beginner to winner. Yeah. Right now, before we do, I am going to, as always, suggest that if you have not, you should get my nine minute kettlebell and bodyweight challenge. Uh, as the name implies, it only takes nine minutes long. And uh, the nice thing is that the movements that are in it are very non-technical. So actually, they're very beginners friendly. And you can add it to any other program you're doing. It's, it's designed in a way that will be invigorating and not something that will completely wipe you out. So 9minutechallenge.com, you can get your hands on a free copy of it. And uh, I think you will find it to be quite enjoyable. So without further ado, Jared Evans. Jared, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Alex. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Now, uh, I've known, we've, we've known each other for at least a little while. Not, not personally, like face to face. You know, like everything nowadays, everything is like right. online. Uh, we've right. lived in the matrix longer than we probably should have, but um, we have talked on a number of occasions, we've done some consulting together, and um, I'm curious in particular, because I'm always curious about this sort of a thing when it comes to any of my, my colleagues, what is your origin story? Like, how did you get involved with fitness? How has your training evolved over the years? Give us a little bit of an idea of uh, the, the origin story of Jared Evans. Sure. Um, it could have gone either way, honestly. It could have been a villain origin story instead of, you know, hopefully the hero is what I'm trying to be. But uh, it started. Both in, are cool, man. <laughs> yeah, right. It's maybe it maybe may a more compelling story sometimes with with the bad guys. But um, I'm, I'm definitely a superhero, you know, Marvel fan. So that's why I think in terms of that. But it uh, really started with bullies in uh, middle school. I have them to thank for setting me on this path because. I was, um, you know, kind of a weird, awkward kid, and uh, I, I was first in a Christian school until I was in like third grade, so I was super naive, super innocent, and then my parents were like, all right, we can't afford this anymore, so we're going to send you to public school, and I was totally unprepared for that, <laughs> and throwing in with the, into the lion's den, as it were. Yeah, and I had a rough go, and, um, you know, I was like, wow, this, this is not good, and seeking um, martial arts and fitness as an extension of that was my way of trying to find uh, self-protection. I was trying to feel safe in the world mm -hmm. because I didn't like being bullied and chased around and, and hit and made, made fun of. So I, I said, all right, I got to get bigger and stronger and learn how to fight so that I can protect myself. But that was just the entry point after and after a while. And that worked, by the way, like people didn't mess with me. By the time I was in high school, nobody was messing with me. <laughs> so it worked. Nice. But then I realized, hey, I really like um, and I'm still a martial artist. I've been a martial artist since I was you know, 15. Um, and I love that for its own sake. But it got me into the world of you know fitness and realizing that, hey, this is pretty good. I can you know, see improvement on a multiple multiple levels of you know self-development but also my body and how i can move the things i'm capable of and you know developing the confidence and all of those aspects so it kind of started from there and i went into these different directions for doing other jobs and fitness and martial arts was kind of a hobby but eventually after a long windy road i eventually decided okay i'm gonna do this as a profession because i wanted to help people that was always kind of in my uh, dna i think and it was just kind of a marriage of the two things i wanted to help people and do this other thing that i was also really passionate about which was fitness 
in a way that I could, you know, try to give some of that safety, security, that self-improvement, that the health benefits of fitness to other people and uh, teaching is another thing that I enjoyed. I figured that out along the way that I enjoyed teaching people stuff. So it was just kind of over time picking up different concepts that resonated with me and things that I was good at and kind of fusing that all into one thing, but it took a long time. Like I didn't Mm -hmm. start full-time coaching until probably 2015, but Mm -hmm. like you mentioned, like I've done, done it for 13 years roughly, you know, part-time here and there as I was finding my way through the world, but it was, it was a long time coming. Certainly, certainly. Now, you know, what's interesting is uh, Ido Portal, who is a very famous uh, Israeli movement expert, has said, I remember reading an article with him once, he said that everybody is a teacher. And he, he and I thought, ah, okay, this sounds like one of those philosophical things that gurus like to say, but he actually had a really good point. He said, if somebody approaches you on the street and they say, how do I get to such and such place? At that moment, you're a teacher. You have to teach them how to get there from where they are right now. And sure. I thought, wow, you know, that, that really is very compelling. It, it makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, one of the things that people learn, especially when they love to teach and they love to help guide people, is that a lot of times, uh, especially because they began their own path, as you described yours, as having begun in, in an elementary school and then progressed through, through high school, you kind of forget what it's like to not know how to do these things. Like you build up this momentum and you kind of build up this this um, certain level of ability where it becomes like second nature. And that's really what you want, but it can be difficult to put yourself back in the beginner's shoes to understand how to help them. So what were some of the challenges that you encountered when you became a teacher? Like what were some of the difficulties that you had in, in helping people and how did you overcome them in order to, to meet that goal that you had? Right. Well, in the beginning, I didn't really have any formal education. Uh, much, much later, when I was uh, about 25, I went to school and I got my bachelor's in exercise science. After I got out of the Air Force, I used the GI Bill for that, which was pretty mm-hmm. cool. But in the Very beginning, cool. I, I didn't have any formal education. So it was just things that I knew from karate, really. Um, karate was my first martial art. And um, it, it was based on just body weight stuff. The instructor I was under, he was more of a traditional guy. He was really uh dogmatic honestly about his approach to fitness and it was body weight is the way to go and he was very against weight training he said that's going to make you slow and stiff it's stupid don't do that so that was what stuck with me for um you know most of my karate career that first like four or five years and so that's what i was trying to teach people when i was working them out i'm like we're going to do body weight stuff and you know over time i realized that's not the only way to do it and, and for a lot of goals, it's not even the best way to do it. So um, becoming less dogmatic and being op- more open-minded was something that took time and a lot of you know trial and error, self-exploration and seeing what worked for people across, you know, working with hundreds of people over time, you, you get a lot of data and y- yeah. you can't really, you can't really substitute that for anything else. You can read books and get theory, but until you put into practice what you're doing and it's, if you're just with yourself, that's fine. And you can figure out what works for you. But if you're talking about training other people, I think you need to train a lot of people to be able to make, you know, good generalizations that really, Mm -hmm. you know, carry weight. Cause if you only train three or four people, it's like doing a study with a small sample size, your, your conclusions aren't that powerful. Yeah, no, I like the way you said that too, because uh, it is true. I think that there are a lot of people well, look, it's like they say, you know, the less you know, the more you think you know. And I think that a yeah. lot of people get into, I mean, it could be anything. It can be uh, personal training is a great example of it. But uh, they try to uh, generalize their their approach. Like you mentioned, your karate instructor tried to generalize his approach to just calisthenics. Not saying, look, this is my preferred way. And it's because it, it helps build this style of karate and this, that, and the other thing. But, but you know, relying on like myths about weight training in order to discourage people from doing it. So it really didn't necessarily help people like the body weight stuff certainly helped to the degree to which body weight training can help. Um, but yeah, you, you can't apply that to everybody. And I, I think one of the things that you're pointing out too, that I want the audience to know is that when you say that, you know, you get a, a, a better sample size from having trained, let's say a couple hundred people. Um, we're also talking about a certain niche of people. Like if you had trained a couple hundred athletes, then without question, the conclusions you would have drawn would have been very different. 
but um, but you have uh, a knack for training beginners in particular. And so there are certain things that I think in particular uh, beginners need on average, especially because uh, when we think about a niche, it's not just people who are sort of beginners at training, but they also probably have desk jobs. Maybe they're not all that physically active. Like they don't necessarily even do gardening or you know, uh, uh, work around the house in terms of like repairs and stuff. So they, they may not have that much familiarity with their body. So what are some of the things that you, with the sample size that you got, what are some of the things that you learned about training beginners that helped you to grow as a personal trainer? Yeah. Um, one is, you know, they definitely all have their own starting point and to, you know, respect that. Because even if you're a beginner, like you had kind of mentioned earlier, you might have, you know, um, done some things in high school or, you know, in a, in a sport, and then you feel like, all right, yeah, I'm like, you know, I, I am an athlete or I was an athlete, but a lot of people don't realize that goes away after a while if you're not using it. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you have to take that into account and also can, you know, convince the client of that from, you know, my perspective, like, Hey, we got to take things easy. I understand you you know, benched 405 in, in high school, but like that was 30 years ago, you know, and you haven't done any weight training since then. And bench press, by the way, is maybe not the best thing for you right now because you're complaining about your shoulder hurting you all the time. So like, maybe we should yeah. do some other stuff. <laughs> and, um, you know, if they're not that person, if there's somebody that's never really done anything, then you have to like, kind of, um, convince them like, it's going to be okay. We're going to start, you know, with really basic stuff. And we're going to build from there, you know, um, meet them where they're at and just make sure that they're going to be feeling safe and, you know, don't hurt them. You know, it's, it's, it's like being a doctor, like do no harm. You know, that's, yeah. that's the first thing. Keep them, exactly. keep them safe. So I learned that, you know, you have to start people at a really basic level and watch out for, um, you know, a lot of muscle soreness because if they haven't done anything if you if you make them work out at a level where they're like oh wow that was a good workout they're probably going to be crippled the next you know a few days like yeah. my, at least my approach is when i work with someone that's pretty much brand new that first workout i'm like really gentle and i'm just exploring movements and kind of assessing them as we go and at the end they'll be like all right yeah that was good but then i'll like check in with them the next couple of days and they're like wow i'm really sore but during the workout, they might not have even gotten like out of breath or broken a sweat yeah. and, and that's okay. So, but the people's perceptions of like what makes a good workout because of things like CrossFit and what they've seen on line, you know, with these, these video ads, it's all like high intensity, like pop, 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 quick movement. And, you know, that looks cool. And they're like, oh, that's what I need to do, you know, but that's not where you should start. That's not where you yeah. should start. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out too, because that was, that has basically been my approach as well is that um, I get now generally speaking, uh, I have had because I had a lot of people who were sent to me by by physical therapists. I had people who were more than happy to start off a bit easy because it was in their field of vision, you know, a pain and discomfort and, and that sort of a thing. And so they knew that like, okay, well, you know, we're going to start off a little bit easy. And then we'll, we're going to work things. Uh, we're going to make things a bit uh, tougher as, as time goes on. But uh, it's very true. A lot of times people are, they, they come to you and they're like, I, I just want to get a good workout. I want to sweat and all this other stuff. And it's like, you have to help them see it from a different perspective. And I think that, especially if you tell them, okay, look, the first work, the first workout, it's a lot of assessment on my part, because I have to guide you. So here's what we're going to do. You know, you might know, it might feel like during the workout, it's not that hard, but I'll bet you that the next couple of days, you're going to feel really sore in muscles that you haven't felt in, in quite a long time. And um, the better they understand why you're doing what you're doing, I think it's easier to get them to kind of buy into actually doing it. Um, you know, with this in mind too, because uh, again, you have a very good professional approach, but what are some of the biggest mistakes most personal trainers make when they are training beginners? Probably not, not assessing people enough mm -hmm. and just not, not starting them at that baseline intensity that we're talking about, just trying yeah. to throw them into whatever's trendy. And, you know, there, there are a lot of bad trainers in the industry. I'm sorry. You know, I, I'm That's not true. saying everybody, I'm not naming names, but. But uh, why not? Let's name names. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, v shred. Don't follow that guy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. A little drama for the show. <laughs> but, you know, people need to know that 
not all trainers are created equal. You should, yeah. you know, uh, vet your trainer. Like I would, like when, I, um, if I'm looking for somebody to train me, I'm going to, you know, see what their background is, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to have, you know, a PhD or even a bachelor's like I do, but, you know, they should have experience and they should have a well thought out practical approach and, a, you know, a good track record of, you know, yeah. being successful and taking care of people. And they're not just, you know, somebody that's, you know, just trying to make some quick money because, you know, they're sick of their other job or it's like a side hustle for them, you know, yeah. and they're not really like passionate and interested in it. So make sure that uh, your coach that you're hiring, I'd say number one, really, you know, cares about you because if, if that's not there, then, you know, everything else is kind of suspect to me, you know, they're, they're probably not going to be giving you their best effort to keep you safe, make, make sure you, that you're, you know, meet, meeting your goals, that you're making progress. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even just paying attention, I've seen trainers that when I've been like in apartment gyms, for example, and there's like another trainer there that's, you know, coaching somebody and they're like on their phone, you know, half the set and they're not, they're not even counting reps. They're not watching the person and they're like, all right, you done. All right, let's go do this. And they're having them do whatever, but it's like, they don't even care. You can see it. Yeah. And I wonder if the client can see that. And I don't say anything. Maybe I should, but I, I'm like, all right, whatever. Well, but yeah, that's, that's, I, a, that's tough, man. Yeah. I, I just wonder if, if that client, that person knows, like, that's not how it should be. A personal trainer should not be, you know, aloof and kind of like you know, totally disinterested in what's going on. You're paying them to be there to guide you and take care of you. They should be paying attention to what you're doing and interested in what you're, what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, actually, I think, um, probably a lot of beginners don't really know what to expect from a personal trainer. And True. I think they very well might see that as just being like normal because think about it like this. So we see exercise as meaning uh, personal trainers like us, we see exercise as being like a skill and that you're doing certain movements and it's a skill. It's not just you're making the shape of the movement and then you know, some question marks and all of a sudden results come out on the other end, you know, right. it's, right. Uh, it's something that actually requires some focus on technique and it, you know, it doesn't have to be obsessive because certain exercises technique wise are, are going to be easier than others. But you, if you're paying somebody for their time, you are paying them for their attention and um, barring, I mean, I, I, in fact, I remember reading uh, an article a couple of years ago that was like saying, here's how to be a better personal trainer. And one of the things was like, you might have, I mean, sure you have the app on your phone that has like the, you know, the, what do you call it? Uh, like a timer or like, you know, whatever sure. it may be, but get a separate one so that it doesn't look like you're on your phone. Because the last thing that you want is to give the impression to your, your clientele that you're not really with them. You're on the phone, even though it, you may only be actually using that, that app that has the timer yeah. and, and what have you on it. And I, I do think that's very important uh, because the more, uh, people begin to expect less from personal trainers, the less likely they are going to be to pay for one later on down the line. Like let's say the first one, the first one they have is not very good. They're not going to see it. Like everybody has seen a doctor. Everybody knows there are some doctors who are better than others. Um, but I think a lot of people, like you said, they get the impression that, you know, all personal trainers are, are kind of built the same and they don't really, even if intuitively they might know some might be better than others, they're, we don't have like a standard by which to measure it, uh, or most people don't realize there's a standard by which to measure it, uh, like they would for, for a doctor. So um, what would be some of the things that you would tell, in addition to some of the stuff that we've already gone over, you know, you mentioned vetting your personal trainer, making sure they have a good track record. Let's say you do have somebody who is, uh, somebody who's interested in investing in some personal training. Uh, they find somebody who's new and doesn't have a very a big track record yet. Um, maybe they are doing it part time. And so they've got a couple of what appear to be strikes against them. What then are some things that they can tell within like a single session to know whether or not it makes sense to sign up for a package deal and that this person might uh, grow to become a very good personal trainer, but is starting as many personal trainers have to start, which is, you know, doing it on the side, uh, part time, uh, not having a lot of experience, that sort of a thing. Right. Yeah. And I, and I'm, I'm not against people doing personal training part-time or anything, you know, no, of like course. sometimes uh, that's what I, that's how I started. Like you can't always Likewise. just quit your job and just like dive straight into 
you know, full-time personal training. You've got to kind of build Unadvisable, yeah. every, everything. Yeah. It's, it's for, you know, financial um, security. So I'm not against that, but uh, I, I think it's first and foremost, what I said before is like, do they care? You know, does the personal trainer care? If, if you feel like they're engaged with you, they're invested in what you want and they're, they're trying to help you get to your goals and not their goals. That's a thing I've seen a lot too, is personal trainers have, you know, a certain way of training and they train everybody the same, same way. And they're training somebody for how they would want to train themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not good. Unless that client wants the same thing that the trainer does. They're mm -hmm. like the, the trainer that's, you know, they're a bodybuilder and they're super jacked and they, they just want to get bigger and, and shredded and cut. If a client comes to them that wants that same thing, maybe those are more in line, but you still shouldn't train that client the same way. Cause they're at a different point, unless they're already jacked, in which case they probably don't need you. So, you know, are they training you in a way that is aligned with your goals, your goals, not their goals. And do they care? I think are probably like two of the most important things. And um, a thing that's for me, I don't know if, if you do this, but I always take notes for my clients. Mm -hmm. um, unless it's one that I only see like once a week, I can kind of remember what we're doing. But ones that if we're training two, three times a week or more than that, I've got to write stuff down because things get just too too complex. So I have separate journals for my, my clients. I'm old school. I do it on paper. And yeah. so I, I write stuff down so I can track because I'm a little more like numbers driven and I want to see that we're making progress. And if things aren't going right, I can look back and try to figure out why. And that yeah. gives us, you know, measuring measuring points through our, you know, our training time together and we can make sure that we're on the right track. So I think that's yeah. something that I don't see a lot of other trainers do is write stuff down and track numbers for the yeah. lifts and reps and, and things like that. But I think that's, I think that's very important. I'm a big fan of journaling uh, for your workouts. Workout logs are, I think, super useful. And I think more trainers should track their clients data that way. Yeah, you know what? I it's interesting because number one, I agree with you 100. percent But number two, and I think you'll agree with with what I'm about to say is that uh, you've probably had plenty of clients for whom you've had you have to change the plan pretty regularly, and it's not to keep them entertained, but rather because something's happened. You know, like oh gosh, you know, uh, kid was up all night puking, and they only got three hours of sleep. So today's supposed to be the hard day, but today I think we're just going to do a, a really light technique day, right? The only way that you're right. going to know how hard to have uh, to push them or whatever is if you know what they did before. And I, I'll tell you, I, there's a story from right. my own early days as a, as a trainer. I worked at a Mexican restaurant as a waiter <laughs> when I was uh, first getting started in personal training. And uh, some of my first clients were people who um, either worked at that restaurant or um, were recommended to me by people who did work at, at the restaurant. So I have to thank these people in retrospect because they gave me a chance when, you know, it's like when I wasn't slinging enchiladas and tacos and stuff like that. I was, I was trying to help people get stronger, but one of the gals was one, a manager. And I remember she would, uh, uh, she would come over and we'd work out in my backyard and I kept pretty copious notes about what we did. And, you know, I would write, um, I would write down the, uh, the workouts, I'd write down the sets and reps and everything like that. And the, I remember one time she was a little bit concerned that maybe we weren't making any progress so she was like okay i i don't know i mean it's been like a month like um are, are we, am i really getting any better like i just don't feel like that much different and i said okay well how about this take a look at this and i had a, a notepad and i wrote um okay this was your hard day uh, a month ago we're doing i don't remember how many sets and reps it was but it was you know like swings with a i think a 20 kilo kettlebell and I was like, and this is your easy day this month, a month later. And it was the exact same workout. So I was like, what was hard for you a month ago was your easy light day this month. And so when she saw that, and it was written on paper, you know, like I had to flip through several sheets of it for her to be able to see it. Then she was like, okay, yeah, I can see it. Because a lot of times, like, you know, you'll probably agree with this. Clients, um, they're not necessarily going to track their workouts. They're relying on you to do it. And if you can show them, look how far you've come in like four weeks, it's going to give them a lot better buy-in than if you're like, nah, you're, you're doing fine. You're doing great. Like people want to see some numbers. People trust numbers more than just assurances, you know? 
Um, so I agree with you completely. But then the other side of things is that, like, I'll give you a, another example. I had a, a guy when I lived in, in Israel who was far and away the most successful person I've ever trained, like multimillionaire, venture capitalist, um, PhD uh, in philosophy from a really good school in, uh, in the United States, spoke English like an American, uh, really like uh, an exemplary dude. But, you know, he didn't have the mental bandwidth to, to focus on, on all the fitness related stuff. So when I would train him, the main focus was, you know, uh, making sure that what we were doing was going to be appropriate for that, that day. And um, I would always write out a workout ahead of time. And it was so rare to do it as it was written, because I would, you know, I would talk to him like, I was, you know, I was, uh, I fell on my elbow the other day and, and like, and I'll push ups hurt, you know, we can't do this, that, and the other thing. So I would have to be really inventive about what I would do to, to help him move along. So, um, to the personal trainers who are out there listening, that if you are not doing that, it's a very good idea to keep this in mind that yes, periodization and, and programming are very important. Um, but you have to make sure that you can make changes on the fly because ultimately, if all you're doing is foisting upon your, your uh, personal training client uh, something as though it were written in stone rather than on paper, you're going to find that you're probably going to do them more harm than good. Totally. I, I totally agree with you. And I've had clients like that too, where they always have something going on and it's like, oh, we can't do that today. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll do this instead. Oh, you have this going on there. Okay. We'll do this instead. So I know what you're, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, this has been a very stimulating interview and I really hope that the people who are listening in have been taking copious notes uh, because I think that anybody who wants to hire a personal trainer need to keep these things in mind. Again, we don't have uh, like some set in stone rules, but there are some insider tips that Jared and I could give you on, on how to hire a good personal trainer, make sure you're getting the best value for your money. And also that, you know, you're not going to have to maybe hire a physical therapist or a chiropractor immediately afterwards. <laughs> yes. Um, that is an important thing to keep in mind. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, Jared, where can people follow you online so that they can soak up more of these bombs of the knowledge variety? <laughs> well, I uh, think the easiest place to go is my website, which is everythingbutthegym.com. And nice. I have the same same name for my uh, Facebook business page and my Instagram. And I'm on TikTok. Too. I haven't done much on there yet, but I'm messing around with it. So everything but the cool. gym, you can find me all over the place. Awesome. Everything but the gym.com. Also look up everything but the gym on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok. Um, any other, uh, I would imagine any other uh, uh, social media platforms, you might also be there. So check those out, folks. Ev uh, anything but the gym, correct? Everything but the gym. Everything but the gym. Okay. I knew it didn't sound right. Everything but the gym. Uh, <laughs> dot com. So, Jared, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate it. Been a pleasure. And folks, as always, have fun and happy